My parents' age, my parents are 82 now, but um, I saw her in the food line parking lot gosh, about probably 15 years ago, and I asked her how she was, I hadn't seen her for a long time. She had a son um, my age, and we were, went to confirmation class together and all that kind of stuff, and, and um, so she, she knew I was a nurse, and so she just kind of unloaded on me in the parking lot about how miserable she was and how nobody would believe her about her pain and, and because they could never find anything, it's just all in your head. and. Um, you know what, our, our, our central nervous system is where you, sit, you do sense the pain, isn't it? Yes, it is in your head. Pain is always in your head. <laughs> you know, if you got pain, it's, it's in your head. <laughs> I mean, duh. We, now we know that, right? So, so that, that's a really stupid thing to say. Well, it's just in your head. Well, sure it is. If you hurt, it, it's in your head. So, okay. But anyway, the fibromyalgia is not... Um, an inflammatory disease, but it actually was in the chapter. I don't know if you saw that with the like, rheumatoid arthritis. It was some, you know, a few pages beyond that. I think it was. Um, but it, it is not inflammatory, but it kind of acts like it. And so um, if they don't know the cause. Um, they call it chronic pain syndrome. And, and um, in, in the Iggy book, they're calling it FMS for fibromyalgia syndrome. Um, and so, so if you see the FMS, that's what they're talking about. You do see chronic fatigue syndrome a lot of CFS, um, but I guess they just sort of started doing that with the, the fibromyalgia like that. But anyway, um, they, they think that there may be some, well, it has to be a connection between the CNS, like we said, because that's where your brain is, where, where you sense the pain, isn't it? I mean, you know that it hurts in a certain <coughs> peripheral area, but, but we, we know now that there's pain receptors in, in our brain never see it ask. So, so that's that's um, pretty. That's, that's really kind of a redundant thing to say, I guess. But um, anyway, it said that there may be. They don't really know, but it could be something to do with the thalamus or the hypothalamus. That, um, that there's some sort of because those are regulatory um, organs, and I'm not. The, I need to beef up on all of that to understand it um, more thoroughly. But <coughs> but um, it's more common now. Iggy said it was 30 to 50, but but the concept book last year said 20 to 50. So I'm going to take the 20 to 50 so that we'll be have a broader view of it. Um, and sometimes there can be a family history of, of, um, of the, the painful syndrome. And then um, if you have another rheumatic disorder like RA or, or lupus, then, then um, you can have fibromyalgia along with it. Um, and you can have disturbed sleep patterns and you don't know if, this, if you're not sleeping because of the fibromyalgia or that fibromyalgia um, you know that that, that that that's a, a symptom of it, or or is it a cause of it? So you're you're just kind of going in these this vicious cycle, is it? But but people don't sleep well one way or the other, so we have to have to deal with that if if um if that's one of their manifestations. So, um, you you saw, and I, I'm not I've, I've got I'm really saying what's on the next slide, but I, I, you don't have this picture in your book. I'm kind of surprised, or I didn't see it. Did y'all? Maybe it was on some other page, and I missed it. But I did not see that. And we have two two pictures of this. But this is showing the the tender points that that um, you can have, and that that sort of determines the the diagnosis. But if you go on that website that I published for you as one of the resources, or I, I posted for you. Um, it tells you that, that sometimes you, they'll diagnose you even if it's not exactly according to, you're supposed to have like 11 of the 18 tender points or trigger points to, to diagnose it. It's, but it still can be very vague if you're really, really miserable with it and it's the same type of pain. Um, they say it's um, sort of a, a gnawing pain or a burning pain is how a lot of people will describe it. Like the lower cervical vertebrae um, and the, the second rib the lateral epicondyle just near your your um, your elbow and um, in the in the inner aspect uh, the medial aspect of the knee and then we're, we're um, it's at the top of the buttocks and that these are some areas where we're doing we're doing injections kind of in the in the buttock area so though here at some points the occipital area on both sides um, and then the this is super Planetus or something? I can't even read it. No, supraspinatus. Spinatus. I don't know how you say that. Anyway, I'm not anatomy. I, I read this stuff and I see it, but I don't know. I never hear it. And then the trapezius muscle. I think we kind of know that in the shoulders. So if your, if your trapezius is messing with you, there's a lot of things about like lifting things and um, taking care of young children or whatever. That and if it's in young young people. It is mostly in women, but it, it can be in some uh, in some males as well because that that Dr. Teitelbaum that I posted the website about he, he had fibromyalgia. He has fibromyalgia. He, he's a he 
um, treats people for it too. So anyway, um, so we got sleep disorders and fatigue and depression and I'll move this down, but um, anyway, infections, altered perception, and normal stimuli, use of statin drugs can increase the risk of fibromyalgia. A lot of times our patients, at least at Rowan, get their statin drugs at bedtime, but but any of y'all look up the statin drugs for clinical to see what one of the side effects is? What? Well, Candy, what, what about the muscles and stuff? I've heard about the muscle aches being a side effect of it. And um, sometimes they think there's some of the that may result from, from the statin use or a foot. And um, uh, have, have y'all heard of uh, rhabdomyolysis? Well, I have somebody in rhabdomyolysis. I want to rhabdomyolysis. Do I need to, to point it out? <laughs> sensitivity of the brain to the pain signals because of the neurotransmission. And if you, if we, once we talk about the drugs, you can kind of see what the neurotransmitters are, or what we're talking about, um, that, that, um, that help to, to uh, inhibit those signals. So pain can be described as burning and gnawing, and it tends to come and go. Some people have it for longer periods than others, though. They may have it constantly <coughs> A number of weeks or months or something, and then it might put up for a while, and then it might come with a vengeance, or you may have bad episodes once a week or something. So it's it's very different. It's, that's why it's been so hard to categorize and name it and figure out what exactly to do about it. But okay, and sometimes there there some doctors think that it may be a complication of hypothyroidism because this thyroid regulates what. Metabolism. Uh, metabolism and everything, so maybe it has something to do with, with metabolism, so we, we don't really know. Um, and it can be a complication, possibly. It can be just coincident to rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or sleep apnea, too, especially in men, the sleep apnea. A lot of men with sleep apnea have, have um, fibromyalgia, or there's a relationship there. So we don't know if there's cause and effect, or is it just coincident or a relation that it's related to, but not, not cause and effect. That's where we're just so anyway, it can be a gradual onset of chronic muscle pain, um, numbness or tingling in the extremities. Like if Iggy had so many more manifestations than what our, our older books have. When a, like in Ramon and Burke, when we our, that was like the second book that I had taught out of um, for this, it just had like a, a few paragraphs, and it made it sound like it was just a bunch of malarkey, and that this is not not anything important, and people are just. You know, just trying to trying to get pain medicine and trying to get attention and all that sort of thing. It was not sympathetic at all. I was like, okay, that's why I've got some videos to show you that with the sympathetic doctor that I just love. I have a problem now, so I would go to New York to go to see him. So I hope I don't have to, but if I do, I'll just go see him. And he's a he's a pain expert, and he really goes into the whole picture instead of just okay, there's no cause and there's no MRI evidence or whatever. So you're you're just you're just uh, talking out of your head, and you're just a drug seeker. So anyway, um, but anyway, you can have numbness or tingling, tingling in extremities. Um, some people are sensitive to unpleasant smells. I had never heard that part before. Loud noises and bright lights. And so sometimes, like bright lights, can trigger migraines and such, can't they? Or maybe even the loud noises trigger migraines. I'm not, I don't know that awful much about. It. I know my, I think my son, one of my sons has migraines. So that's why I know it. <laughs> and so it has not had had as much problems as it's in college. But but um but you know the the, the bright white aura sort of thing and then you can have migraines along with um um probably as well. So anyway, um the onset can be real sudden, but when they really are relating to it, they again it's not necessarily cause and effect, but it can be um, following a viral illness. One thing about viruses I heard, I'm going to tell you all this um, long time ago, 
couple weeks ago, but I heard it on the radio that this man wrote a book called Missing Microbes. You know, I've been so interested in this microbiome and all the all the organisms that are in us that, that are not our own cells and all that kind of thing. And he was talking about the, um, not just bacteria. He said we have quadrillions of different viruses, or, or viruses in our, our, our body, maybe not all different Quadrillions. I don't even know how to write that. <laughs> that's like a lot of viruses act on the bacteria that's in our gut um, to kind of hold it back. And then some of it can be pathologic and, and all, of course, and cause disease. But um, most of the time, they're in there just helping keep the other things in the fungi and the, the other, you know, other viruses that are that are more pathological, like like herpes and stuff like that. They can keep some of those others in check. I thought that was very interesting. That's something I want to read over the summer if I have a chance. I used to love fiction books, and now I'm just like, they kind of bore me now. I want to read stuff about the brain and the and the gut. I want to learn more about about guts and guts and brains. Um, so anyway, um, it's just so fascinating. But anyway, the, the pain is produced by palpating the, those tender points or those trigger points. Um, anyway, you can have aggravation on it by deep sleep deprivation. You can just you know, nap and wake up and then wake up and get into the deep sleep layer. Um, you can avoid or limit caffeine, alcohol, or any other stimulants or sleep disturbing things that, that could to bother your sleep. Because even though alcohol makes you sleepy, it makes you wake up, your, make your, makes your sleep wake cycle um, abnormal too. So you, you don't necessarily feel rested when you when you do wake up. And then um, try to try to develop a regular sleep pattern. And, and my dentist told me that because I grind my teeth and all this stuff. Well, you just need to sleep. You just need to sleep. I'm like, how do I make myself sleep? I, don't, I mean, I guess I shouldn't drink so much caffeine, but I have to drink caffeine because I don't sleep so well sometimes. This is just another, I think this one's a little bit clearer as far as the words and everything on there to see where your tender points are. So, so I'll, I'll put both of them in here. All right, so we, we do a history and physical and to see what's, what the patient's been going through, if they have other, other diseases coincident to it or maybe related to it. Um, history of widespread pain at least three months duration and 11 and 18 tender points or trigger points. Um, and actually, the, you can have the tightness or the muscle spasms or bleeding, insomnia, headaches, morning sickness, painful menstrual periods, memory problems, which they call fibro calls. Um, maybe that's what I've been, I couldn't, couldn't think of all those words I was trying to tell Laura. I've got some sort of fog anyway. Um, and they, they can be aggravated by extreme exertion, and that's different with each person, but, but it can be uh, related to a lot of exertion. Uh, and then, of course, stress, emotional stress or physical stress on the body, um, and possibly even weather changes. You know, people say, that arthritis say that they can tell when, when it's going to rain because of their bones and joints, and so I guess they have most people feel it by the, by the muscles. Right so, but there's no elaborate diagnostic test that can make the diagnosis. Um, you want to check the thyroid function, the <coughs> medical disorders like already in the lupus, to see if those are actually causing the symptoms and, need, and treat those. Um, but even if you treat those, then sometimes the fibromyalgia still persists. And so it's really a coincident um, condition rather than um, part of the RA or part of, of the lupus. So, Sometimes it'll resolve just spontaneously, or it can become um, chronic and recurrent. And the, the thing that, that um, um, as, as nurses, we need to, mm -hmm. we need to believe, we, we read about the pain is what? <laughs> Whatever the patient says, and that's, that's the definition, that's the, the official definition of pain. So if the patient says they're in pain, we need to, to uh, validate that, that yes, we, we believe you. <laughs> anyway, this Dr. Heilbaum um, says there's still some doctors. I think doctors are getting a lot better with the, the fibromyalgia idea and the concept. But then there's still some that just are so afraid about the drug seekers because there are a lot of drug seekers. I mean, face it, we, we see that at the hospital. Y'all probably all seen patients that are drug seekers. And, and we, so we know that they're there. We know that they're, they're manipulative and all this sort of thing. And so it's easy to label somebody that's had fibromyalgia as somebody that's manipulative. But we still have, we do have to make good medical judgments. Though. It's really tough to walk that line as a professional um, healthcare person. That it really is. So anyway, you know, Dr. Teitelbaum would say, because he went through it himself, that 
uh, and he's a doctor, I mean, he's an MD, so he says that there's a lot of doctors that just don't know that they don't know, and when you don't know that you don't know, you don't realize how ignorant you are about this, it's easy to just look at x-rays and say, there's nothing wrong with you. So that, that's what he's meaning by, by that. So anyway, patients can get real frustrated because of the lack of any early diagnosis and, and uh, validation, I guess, of, of um, the fact that they do have a cause for their pain. You just can't, just because we can't, you can't find it doesn't mean that I don't have the pain and I don't have a cause of pain. So anyway, they, they um, become real depressed and anxious about, about all of that. So, all right. So it is difficult to treat. You've got to try lots of combinations to see what, what's going to help that particular person. So um, pharmacologic therapies, the SSRIs, what are those? Serotonin. Yeah, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And what's SS in, oh, no, wait a minute, SNRI. I had it wrong in my, my um, PowerPoint. Yeah, selective norepinephrine. And then, then what's Cymbalta? Do you remember that? S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S So we want to block it in the gut, but we, we like it in the brain, don't we? We, we want, like to, to have that feel good. So, so that's, that's what's happening with those particular drugs. I don't know if y'all have even looked at the tricyclic antidepressants much mm -hmm. before. They can really be great adjuncts for pain. They just cause a lot, a lot of drowsiness, and so it's not like you can take it and drive. Or, um, um, my my um, husband's grandmother took it as an adjunct to morphine because she had um, metastatic colon cancer. It's not real common for it to go to the spine. I think it was in her spine. She had radiation therapy and that helped her some, but she still had to have her morphine. And, and you know, you get the tolerance, you have to keep giving more and more and more, but she started having side effects. I don't know if y'all have ever seen anybody on narcotics that's had the, the kind of the jerks. Have you seen that? I mean, she started having this jerky sort of thing going on, and so they, they tried to, instead of increasing her morphine, they um, added the Elevil or the amitriptyline at bedtime because it's better to take it at bedtime and this make you drowsy and then it can really help sleep that. I mean, it can help people sleep if they're having uh, pain that's keeping them from sleeping. But boy, it, it sent her off the wall. I mean, it was just, it was hard. And even being elderly and everything too, it was just, um, it was just a nightmare really that um, she was so confused in where she was and, and uh, she ended up, um, um, she went. She went to the uh, nursing home just because she was more confused. They were having more trouble um, taking care of her and everything. Um, it was. She wasn't very confused though, um, except just right, right prior to the nursing home thing. But she, she got real confused at night, and, and um, they had all of her bed rails totally up. And she got confused and she tried to crawl out the end of her bed and fell and broke her hip and then and she never she really never woke up up. She started having seizures and stuff. And I don't know if that had anything to do with metabolites of some of the meds she was taking, and that's what happens with with uh my parody. Did y'all read about that in the in the pain? The the Demerol, the parody, and that used to be what you always gave people for post op pain when I first got out of school. And we had a, a shot we would give IM you know, never again. You could take a pill, it was called never again. Because the pentagon part in it would, um, uh, would potentiate the, the, um, the opioid and uh, give you a lot better pain relief and relaxation and all that sort of thing. And uh, we even gave, we had some people with back surgeries on the first unit that I worked on that um, they felt like they was, those people were drug seekers and we would uh, end up using placebos too. We did, I, I think y'all read about the placebos. Are placebos anything that we ought to give people? No. Like these fibromyalgia drug seeking people, do you think we ought to give them no. placebos and just tell them that we're giving them uh, or something? 
did y'all get that really strong thing that that's absolutely unethical behavior to, to use placebo to unless there's some sort of trial and the patient knows that they might be getting uh, just a sugar pill. So, anyway, I, I, that's just some points. There's so many points I'd like to make y'all we never have, have enough time, but that's, that can be, that can certainly relate to this. Okay, and, and um, sometimes the complementary um, alternative can, um, can be light therapy, like with tanning beds, but not, you know, that's not, it's not a great thing when you read all this stuff about the skin cancer and the um, UVA, I think that when they started using that, they realized how risky it was, but it, you know, that, that may be something just in, in small doses that might help. Um, and then resistance training, we're doing some strength training and resistance, and then, um, whole body vibration, I'm not really sure how that, how that works, <laughs> but Anyway, the, the, um, the, those are, the studies have been really, really small, so it's not like that standard therapy, but those are some things that, that some people say have been um, given them relief. So anyway, acupuncture um, can be used with all kinds of things, but it hasn't really helped fibromyalgia people a whole lot. But you know, that may be something to try because some, maybe that one, maybe one person, one individual would have some relief from that. Um, but it can help them to sleep and to, to be less anxious. So if it can do that, and, you know, y'all, your concept maps will do anxiety and pain are related to one another and all that sort of thing. So if you can um, get some of the anxiety down, then maybe the, the pain will be more powerful too. So um, the, we talked about the Cymbalta. We got the Skelaxin. Do you know what Skelaxin is? Is that, can you kind of tell by the name of what that is? That's the relaxer. Yeah, yeah, well, I just call them what's exactly. Yes, sir. And then Ultram, we have a few patients that had Ultram. My mother in law takes that actually, but it's, it has kind of tricyclic antidepressant um, effects as well as some opioid properties, but it doesn't work exactly like the, the standard opioids, like the morphine type. So, um, And I, I kind of skipped the up here with the Lyrica and the. Um, and the, the uh, uh, gabapentin, the Neurontin. Neurontin actually um, works really well for a lot of people, um, but it, it's, it's generic. And so once a, a drug's been generic for a long time, but there's, there's not a whole lot of research and development money and with the original pharmaceutical company that came up with it in the first place. And so they just don't, once it's approved, it's out there, and they can use it for whatever they, they you know, want to use it for. But if they're not going to do the research, the drug company's not going to do the research. Now, sometimes the National Institutes of Health will or something like that, but it's not going to be a pharmaceutical research because they, they don't, they're not going to put research and development money in there if it's already out there. Everybody's buying the generic. They, they can't afford to do that. So um, that's really why Lyrica is actually approved because it's still on patent and everything, and they had the research and development funds to, to um, get it approved specifically for fibromyalgia. Um, but neurontin works very, very similarly. And what are, what um, substance are we trying to encourage in the in the CMS um, when we're when we're using the neurontin or the Lyrica? Is, is, and I think the generic names ought to tell you gabapentin and pregabalin. <laughs> Have you read about the GABA? No, no. Some, some of my students have like seizure medicines, and they like seizure medicines have something to do with GABA. So, do y'all remember what the GABA does? I hate to keep thinking about y'all, but I know y'all know. <laughs> what does the GABA do? I know you know. But no, well, what are we after though? Like, just like with the Cymbalta and you know, with the SSRIs and SSNIs, it's not just a good Neurotic. So we're wanting this to we want to inhibit too much signal and it we want to have either the, the feel good or the relaxing kind of thing. So it is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And if you look up neuron, they'll kind of say that they don't really understand real fully how it works, but it does inhibit um, the the rapid firing or, or too um, uh, too strong a firing of, of um of signals um, in, in the, the, the uh, between neurons. And so that's what we're after is to, to uh, relax and inhibit um, extra extra signals. Like, and that's why it works for seizures too, because the, the, you know, you've got too rapid a firing when you've got seizures as well. So, so anyway, this, this time, I'm just trying to get you to 
to understand that when you see this again, that you'll know why why it can be possible. So anyway, nurses are supposed to be supportive and, and um, give as much education as you know. We don't know a whole lot about it, but we'll tell them what we do know and see and tell them that we're going to work with them and see what we can find out that's going to uh, work for them. Okay, and um, I'm not. Oh, I didn't really talk about this Milne mess, whatever. This is really just specifically a, a serotonin, um, well, not serotonin, selective, um, um, yeah, norepinephrine um, reuptake inhibitor, and that's that's just one that it can cause some side effects, though. So that's not not always this one that they started using. And I guess some people are just okay with that. But you have to watch their sodium and and um, watch to see that they don't have um, uh, depression to result. So um, I think y'all. Okay. I think y'all know about activity intolerance for surgical patients and all this sort of thing, but that, that can be a, a problem with um, uh, bottom mouth patients also. Um, we want to have them that's established priorities and have rest periods and naps. So we're going to decide what, what's the most important thing uh, to do rest in between um, activities and delegates on the responsibility that they're not able to fulfill everything that they've got done. Uh, and depression can can result from being a, from not being able to do the activities that you know you feel like you should be doing for your family or your kids, and that, that's very um, very frustrating for a lot of people. And then the f fatigue um, to to um, uh, realize that fatigue is very real, and uh, to um, verbalize and have your therapeutic communication skills, and and um, try to encourage them to to uh, find out what they what kind of activities they can tolerate and enjoy, and then. Um, that. And I did put some notes about the chronic fatigue syndrome. This is mainly what was on in, in your book because they didn't really talk about that so much in our, our concept book before because that wasn't that wasn't a simple. You got a red one in a certain book here, so we got more things. To, but I just want you to see that for comparison because a lot of people have both at the same time, chronic fatigue syndrome and um, and fibromyalgia. And, um, and it does have a, a symptoms criteria list on page 354. And it's just a little short thing just right after the fibromyalgia uh, blurb. So we we'll can just read through that because a lot of times they are coincident. Um, but it, it's, um, it's more common in women. It's like fibromyalgia is. There's no lab test to confirm the diagnosis. Um, there's an unknown cause. It can be immune, endocrine, neurologic, environmental, and there's no specific cure. It's just supportive care. Um, they say that insects don't work real well for some people with fibromyalgia, but um, they, they, they do try it for, for um, chronic fatigue because it may seem to be a well with that as well. Antidepressants, um, sleep, nutrition, exercise, but that's the same kinds of things that you do for um, fibromyalgia. And um, then it does have, a, and they actually have another website, the ncsfa.org, I think I'll, I'll put that on there on, on your notes page, the Natural Chronic National Chronic Fatigue Syndrome and Fibromyalgia Association. So, now that I heard this guy, I think I have that on there too. That that I saw this guy, on, or I heard him on the People's Pharmacy a couple years ago, right before I had to teach this for the first time, and I knew nothing about fibromyalgia except that people were hurt and then doctors didn't believe them most of the time. And this was, I think it's just kind of cool though, the sleep and hormonal support, um, you know, watch for infection and inflammation or in, impingement on uh, muscles and, and nerves and everything, look at all of that um, to see if there's another reason and a way to treat those things to help with the pain, nutritional support and exercise is able but not more. You don't want it to stress your body so much that it, it elicits it's more pain, but you, you can't just sit either because that's not that your pain gets worse if you sit too. So, um, so anyway, this is his website, and he's he's gotten to where he's got all these products that he wants to sell and all that, and that so that kind of gets in the way of some of the good stuff that he's saying. But he went all through his experience and on that um, that 30 minute radio program, and it, it was real interesting. So, so anyway, I, I just thought that would be a good thing for y'all to to realize as a is a resource. Uh, what I'm going to do right now is, is go to, um, this is some really, really short little videos from this doctor that I love in New York. So we will find my links here. Let's see if this will work here. I've got the sound thing up, so I hope we can hear it. Alright, 
fundamentally fibromyalgia is that the, most people think that the problem fundamentally in fibromyalgia is that the ability of the body to sense noxious stimuli has been distorted. So that something that most people feel as being non-painful <laughs> is perceived by the person with fibromyalgia as being painful. Why that is, is not known. What causes that to occur in someone who was normal before is not known. We do know that some people develop these chronic widespread pain syndromes after getting a viral syndrome. So it's possible the nervous system okay. can be invaded by the virus or by chemicals produced by the virus, and that causes altered neurological function. Sometimes fibromyalgia occurs after trauma. Sometimes fibromyalgia appears to occur out of the blue without any precipitating event. But the bottom line is that people with fibromyalgia are experiencing chronic severe pain, typically, at multiple sites. And now they need to be taken very seriously. They need to be understood as having a, an organic disease process like any other chronic disease. They need to be assessed in terms of the pain, and they need to be offered a multimodality strategy for pain control, which tries to get the pain down and their function up. <laughs> I mean, that's just so short and sweet, isn't it? It's just it's so, that's so nice. Okay. <coughs> this is about stoicism. Class, you were really sore. Pain specialists often encounter problems with stoicism. By stoicism, I mean that a person is experiencing a relatively high level of pain, and or maybe they're not functioning because of the pain, but they tend to underreport it. They tend to try to tough it out rather than complain about it. Now, the reasons for this are probably varied. Uh, and, and it's difficult to know in any individual case why a person may react that way. But from the healthcare provider's perspective, it is a challenge. If someone does not adequately report their pain, if, if that person doesn't tell us what that pain is preventing them from doing, there's no way to develop a plan of care to try to fix that. Now sometimes the situation can be improved a great deal if the person brings a spouse or another family member to the appointment, because that that individual, that spouse, can provide a completely different spin on that person's life. Uh, and suddenly you find out that the person is spending most of the day in a chair. Or suddenly you're finding out that person hasn't slept through the night in six years. Or suddenly you're finding out that that person's mood is irritable, angry, and sometimes depressed, even though he seems to be normal in interacting with you. And that kind of information, when it comes from a spouse, can be directly checked with that patient. Oh, in this one. Okay. So, you can actually test genetically um, as early as 10 weeks into a pregnancy using that, um, an amniocentesis um, or some tissue from the placenta, especially if, they're, if, if they know that, you know that it's in a, the family and that there's, a, um, that there's the, the gene is there. So, a test for the sickle cell gene and um, and the, the core blood of newborns is tested for the, for the hemoglobin S. Um, the sickle turbidity test in six months old or, or older, um, and I don't know what all of those are, but there's different, at least there's different tests. Um, and then the, the, you, you want to see how anemic that they, that they um, may be, or are they, um, are they anemic. Um, and the reticulocytes, what do we say that the particular sites are. I didn't close my parenthesis. Yeah, there's a, in, immature red cells, exactly. So they may be making plenty of, or they're trying to turn out plenty more to, to compensate for the, the anemia if you've had um, sickling going on. Because uh, what happens with the with the lifespan of the of the red cells when they have been sickled? By how much? Like 10 to yeah, maybe maybe just uh, you only have uh, 10 percent of the lifespan or something like that. Yeah, so instead of 120 days, maybe just 10 or 15. Um, and then the um, the chronic inflammation that, that this can cause can sometimes um, cause the in increased WBCs. So. Um, 
you know, I was talking about that, that article I looked at that said the anemia of chronic inflammation, anemia, but you can also have a high WBCs because of that as well. Um, so the, okay, let's see. Anyway, um, it's recommended that all newborns be screened because um, lots of ethnic groups can, can display the sickle cell gene, and you can't you can't predict somebody's heritage by the name or their skin color or anything like that. Because um, that, that's not we just don't want to make assumptions. We want to make sure that everybody's tested just, just in case. Because some people don't. Some people have been adopted. They have no idea what what's way back in their in their heritage. So we got to don't screen everybody to be able to catch it early so that um, can uh, do a lot of teaching and, and interventions on the community. So anyway, um, you um, you want to you can test for the number of RBCs that are permanently sickled, um, and uh, it says five to fifty percent of AS patients um, can can have permanent sickling, and uh, um, ninety percent of people that actually have a sickle cell disease. Some, some permanent sickly. So, um, okay, and, um, okay. and we are talking about the sequence, so trying to keep up with the, the demand for the replacement. Um, and then we we'll check for, for jaundice from the, um, what, what's, what's causing the jaundice? The bilirubin. Yeah, the bilirubin. Yeah, the bilirubin. Yeah, the breakdown of the, of the red cells releases a, the, the bilirubin. Situation. Okay, and um, then we saw on the, the slide before about the, all the body systems that can be affected and how. So all body systems are potentially affected. So um, I wanted to try to see if I can switch over here without too much to do, and let's get. This is supposed to be Nicholas. This is actually in that um, NCI website where that, that article is that I had y'all to do. Um, that these videos are in there. You may have already popped into them. I don't know. But I think this is really good. So his dad had um, sickle cell trait and the mom had thalassemia minor. So it sounds like he got the thalassemia and the sickle cell and the thalassemia gave him enough stress that, that that's what made him have the, the sickle cell manifestations because he there's no way he would have two sickle cell genes because the mom didn't have any right I mean that that's a, I haven't thought about that since I've been um, watching that but that must be the reason is that um, that he inherited the, the two abnormal ones of two, two different um, hereditary blood disorders so and they they didn't realize that that's what the mom said if somebody had counseled this we might have um, you know done something different but but they wouldn't have Nicholas if they had not had it. So. Okay. How about caring for people in a, in a crisis? The highest priority as far as this intervention, like for the patient anyway, I mean, you can't say, you have to have, you have to say ABCs, you, you certainly do, but it's, it's the most common problem that the patients perceive that they're having is the pain. So that's, I can't say that that is the most important thing because you, you definitely got to take care of the oxygenation first, don't you? I mean, that, that's really the, the biggie if, if the oxygenation is suffering. So, but as far as the, the patients feeling and wanting, yeah, they may be short of breath, but the pain is what really gets them. So we really want to prioritize that once we get things stabilized with the oxygenation. So. Um, and of course, we'll be hydrating as we go and, and all that sort of thing as, as well. Because why do we want to hydrate? Mm -hmm. To decrease the viscosity between the cells. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it makes the blood thinner. And, and dehydration is one of the what? what is one of the It's a trigger, right? Is there dehydration? It's a trigger. It might even, if you're extremely dehydrated, um, you know, lost in the desert or something like that, somebody who's in the cell trait would probably have symptoms, right? I mean, that, that could be one of the triggers for them. So um, we want to um, prevent and treat infection, um, and that's what we're talking about having some penicillin. I think that'll be later in the, 
in the slides here, but um, if, if you can do um, RBC transfusions, that decreases a percentage of hemoglobin S and, and increases the hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobin A um, levels. And then the hydroxyurea is what they were um, talking about that Nicholas had. And um, if y'all really read ahead to see what that does, it increases production of the hemoglobin F, which is the fetal hemoglobin. The fetal hemoglobin carries a lot more oxygen than the, the sickle cells would. So that's, that's a, um, that would be an abnormality to have a whole bunch of uh, fetal hemoglobin af after birth. Um, but but this, is a, this is a plus for people with sickle cell. So anyway, um, if you've got somebody with mild to, to um, moderate pain, you can use Tylenol or, or other NSAIDs if there's not a, a bleeding problem. Um, and then if there's severe pain, there's, it's often um, requiring opioid analgesics, and it might even be PCA pumps, but um, like morphine or um, any, any opioids could be used. Um, and it's not as an, on an as-needed basis, so if they need something around the clock because it, it, um, it causes more anxiety, more dyspnea and all that, it, it, they continue to hurt. Like, did you hear talk about the hand and foot syndrome? Because the, why were they hurting their hands and their feet? Because the capillary is circulation. Yeah, they're stuck in the capillaries. Yeah, so what's happening to the tissue? It's kind of part of this, the word, yeah, it's the infarction of the, of the tissues and they're not, but, so what is suffering? Perfusion. Perfusion. Yes, that's our, that's our big, big word in this. There's lots of diseases that perfusion is a big deal in. Uh, you know, we're finding that out now. Um, and we don't want to be given IM injections of morphine, would we? Why would we not want to do IM? Perfusion. Because there's all, yeah, they, they, we just said we don't have enough perfusion in the peripheral tissues, so that's not a good idea. Um, you know, they may end up, if they have, have frequent sickling crisis, you say, that they may have a, a central line that they just leave, leave in for a uh, for long term. But that's, again, that's a, that's a reason for what if you have a, you have a central line. Yeah, there's some infection, and that's, that's a, that's a tight rope you have to walk on in the sickle cell. Okay, um, and they, they will give, um, the, the hydration is like hypotonic D5 and W or, or, um, D five and a half normal saline for about four hours is what they say. And that, that could vary in different places, but that's just an example of how they might do that um, to combat the dehydration and, and to, to decrease the viscosity and all that. So, um, and then, of course, the oxygen, you would do that for, for oxygenation as well as uh, comfort because of the, the dyspnea, because of the, the perfusion. Um, and um, they talk about Nicholas getting a splenectomy, so that's where those sickle cells get, get caught up a, a lot of times. And so um, he had to have a splenectomy. Um, I think he had that splenic, um, and he had the, the splenic sequestration, where a sequester is all these abnormal blood cells, but then it, it can be life threatening, maybe that can actually um, lead to death. But anyway, um, so he, he had a splenectomy, and so that decreased his what? Yeah, so he, he probably had to have more um, more of the regular vaccinations, the childhood vaccinations, because that's where those memory cells go um, uh, primarily to, to uh, tell the body that um, next time you're exposed to the, those particular um, diseases like polio and the MMR and all that, then, then uh, they, they, uh, they, they may not have the memory cells to resist that. Um, and then uh, daily prophylactic penicillin, and that's one thing Nicholas said too, that he, he took penicillin. Um, penicillin BK, 1.5 milligrams BIV for children um, for uh, two months to three years, and then, then it's doubled um, if, if, as they get, get bigger. Or amoxicillin, bicillin, every three weeks can be substituted. So, so it's usually a penicillin kind of thing, but if you're allergic to penicillin, you're kind of in trouble too, or right? you might have to go to something else. Um, the erythromycin uh, is, is the, the drug of choice. Now, and those are all generic, so they're probably not so awful expensive. If, they, if people can't take the erythromycin or the penicillin, then they have to take something else that's uh, more expensive and maybe a more awful um, drug than for people who are not, not um, allergic to penicillin. Anyway, um, if, you, if there's infection that's suspected, then you're going to do cultures. Um, the blood of the urine and the throat to see where the source is. 
Um, and, uh, and you know, we, we always, I think you've had this question a whole bunch of times, but if, if somebody, if you suspect somebody has an infection and you've got orders for, um, for, for like Tylenol, they run a fever, they got an order for, for Tylenol, you've got an order for um, starting antibiotics, you've got, got an order for Get your culture first. Get your culture multiple people that can take care of them, you might be able to do a lot of things at one time, but you certainly don't want to start the antibiotics before you've done your culture. So that's, that's the big one. So anyway, you're going to give pneumococcal vaccine to infants and toddlers and children with sickle cell disease. What what age group do we normally vaccinate for pneumococcal? Yeah, like 65, 65, 65, 65, 65, 65, 65, 65, 65, 65, cells show an elongated crescent shape characteristic of sickle cell anemia because I don't know if y'all can read that from here or not but um but you see the sickles mm -hmm. you see sickles in there it's not a, not a huge percentage but they're definitely there aren't they so okay um and we talked about giving RBC um transfusions um <coughs> what's the complication of multiple multiple transfusions iron overload yeah your body wants it normally tries to store and when when uh, red blood cells are, are broken down just don't normally the, you know they have their lifespan 120 days and then then they the body destroys them a lot of the the iron is recycled to make new hemoglobin not all of it is but but, um, but a lot of it is recycled so your body's used to storing it um, at least a certain percentage of, of the, the breakdown products from when the, the cells are destroyed. So um, when you do the multiple red blood cell transfusions, there's even more um, that are destroyed, and, and so then, then you're going to have a buildup of iron. And that can be toxic to what? It's, it's mainly the liver, but it could be other organs, too. It certainly could, other tissues and organs. And um, we don't, don't have a way to medications that de deferoxamine or desferol and um, there's there's some other ones too this or um, I don't know if I can say all the names all the XJ is the the um name the brand name of one of them. all of those have have what three letters that tell you it has to do with iron FAR FAR so, so watch that in, in your generic names of things and when you see something that's got FAR in there it's, it's gonna have something to do with iron and, and uh, so I, well, if you're looking on your inflex and they're asking you what is what is the uh, desferis or however you say it, <laughs> what, what does that do? If you see that FER in there, circle, well, you can't circle because it's going to be on the computer, but you can write yourself a note and put FER, and that's, that's a, a significant thing um, in this question. And, and so I know that it's got to do with iron. So um, you can give it sub-Q or IV, and um, it can cause some allergic responses, and sometimes mainly it's on skin problems. But, um, what's that? Oh, that's yes. On that uh, when I was reading about it, it says only a doctor can mention that unless it's they super unless you supervise. Yeah, they're really that well the the um 
Desferol is the one that's, that's more commonly given, and we used to send our, our patients to the hospital if they were getting an IV. But we did have one lady that, um, did she have ITP? Now I can't remember why she was getting so many transfusions, but she had a blood disorder anyway, it wasn't sickle cell. But she, she had it, um, like a, a, a sub-Q pump, like you would have an insulin pump. And um, and, uh, and she took it over um, like a couple of weeks or something like that with the, with the sub Q pump. So it can be done that way without as close as supervision, but you wouldn't do that the first time. You'd certainly watch them to, to see if they had any problems with it. But, but yeah, that stuff you've got to monitor it so, so closely. Yeah, I've never given up this for them or anything. But the desferol is what they would try first if it's, if it's tolerated. So. Okay, and we'll sit here. Um, oh, oh, in, in the, the transfusion reactions, we already talked about that in the, in the immunity unit. Where, and what, what type of, um, of allergic or hypersensitivity reaction is that? Which number is it? Y'all remember with the, with the blood? Two. 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 Type two. You want platelet cells, either one, red blood cells, which one is? Another two. two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, Good for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Keisha gets a, gets a gold star. Um, okay, and Go then, um, Go Keisha. might have already said a lot of this. Da, 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 da. They may do some prophylactic transfusions when, when um, it's, it's well, been, just been sort of predictable here, so. as to, to um, how often a, a child is sickle. And so, so they may do some prevention of it. And if you have the the spleen is the main one, the lungs get degraded, and then the penis gets probably the process. It can help, but it's all the nitric oxide, it dilates blood vessels. I used to have an article that I would have to do about nitric oxide, but it got to be more than five years old, so I stopped doing it. But it was so interesting about all the things that nitric oxide does. It's actually a, a component of air pollution. But, um, but in our bodies and in, in blood cells, um, that's why, um, like if somebody has um, open heart surgery and, and um, they are transfused blood that's like been stored over 14 days, they're more likely to die because it's been depleted in the nitric oxide. It, it just, as, as it's stored, the, the nitric oxide depletes. So if it's a little fresh um, blood specimen, then, then it's, it's more likely to, to like, continue to dilate so that, that the tissues can perfuse. But if there's not much nitric oxide in there, it actually can cause constriction of the capillaries and everything and actually cause some, some perfusion problems. And you don't want to decrease perfusion when you have, you're having open heart surgery. So that, that was a really interesting thing. And the other interesting thing that we told us about besides the air pollution was that that's, that's what... Um, that's how men have, have erections, is, is nitric oxide. That's what causes the vasodilation, is nitric oxide. So nitric oxide can be a good thing if it's not in air pollution. So anyway, um, and it certainly does, does help the perfusion. So anyway, uh, well, hydroxyurea, this is the one you know, we were talking about with Nicholas. Um, and you see how, I like this picture, this is just showing how it, how it sickles and you got the rods. We had a picture sort of like that, it just was at a different angle, but, but I think that's, that, it makes it really rigid with all those rods in there. Um, but the hydroxyurea, like we said with the, um, the fetal um, hemoglobin, that that can lead to fewer crises, and that Nicholas guy was able to play football. I don't know that that's a... A great idea, but, but uh, later on in the slides it says don't, don't do, um, yeah, right, but, but um, I guess he wanted to be as normal as possible. And again, maybe, maybe he was able to tolerate it better because he didn't have the two sickle cell genes in that thalassemia gene. Maybe there was a little more um, compensation once he got the, the fetal, the extra fetal hemoglobin. I don't know. We'll have to, have to hope for the best for him, but... Um, Anyway, um, it increases the, the uh, mean corpuscular volume. Y'all see that on your CDCs a lot, MCD. Mm -hmm. So that increases the volume um, in, in the um, in RNC. And so the corpuscle is the same. We used to say corpuscle all the time, but that's kind of an old word now. But um, anyway, then it helps to prevent the sickling and 
make uh, fewer transfusions, fewer, fewer hospital visits, fewer crises, as we name them. Um, but it can suppress bone marrow. It's actually a chemo drug. Um, you can use it for, for some, um, for like um, myelodysplastic syndromes and stuff like that that are like pre-leukemic states. And um, the other thing that you can that you can do is is um, uh, hemato hematopoietic still stem cell transplant. We're going to talk about that in uh, leukemia. But um, there's about a 10% recurrence rate even even if you do the transplant. It's very very risky. To, um, you know, risk for infection, risk for bleeding, um, and all, all kinds of problems. The risk for benefits you got to got to um, weigh. So. Let me see if I can find the, the Tiffany video here. Well, anybody that you want to encourage them to, to rest if they're in a crisis because they only have so much oxygen and so much is perfusing through their um, through their, their peripheral tissues and their joints. Um, they can have terrible, terrible joint pain as well as the, the hand and foot. Um, and uh, the um, caregiving activities and play, um, Want, they need to play if it's a child, so they, they need to, to be able to, to rest and, and um, prioritize what um, what we're going to do and space things out to, to where they'll have plenty of, of um, energy. So we want to use um, the IV fluid before and after the transfusion. Um, it has to be saline okay. because dextrose does what to red blood cells? So, you have to be very careful not to give them too much fluid in between, especially little children, because then they can get volume over the water really quickly. Um, anyway, um, we want to avoid the emotional stress or activities that increase cellular metabolism that can cause tissue hy hypoxia. And, and that can be like a daily sort of thing as well. You, want to, um, you don't want to get them so that they're exerting themselves um, too much. If they, um, the other kids in the family are running around, that they're, they're running around, you have to be, be sort of careful and, and look at that. That, that can be um, very difficult for a child not to be able to participate in everything siblings or friends or anyone. And um, look on, on um, chart 42-3 on page 875. That's a, that's a really good one. Um, because you have to take care of the, the people in, in crisis and all. And, and, the, and when you're in the um, child um, childbearing years, they need counseling about, about birth control or, or at least family planning and uh, to um, to see, uh, they, they certainly can have the anamnesis and all that, and see if their if their um, child is going to have a trait, or the, and if they have the disease, they know the child's going to have a trait. So this, this girl just did she knew her, her um, child would have a trait, and she got some good teaching, didn't she? Um, but um, they say sometimes that bearing a method or preferred um, over birth control pills because of the increased risk of what when you got hormonal agents. Clotting. Yeah, so that's that's kind of a inconvenience too. But, um, anyway, uh, the everybody that's taking care, just like with children with cancer, we say that they children with cancer need to have the care from a pediatric oncologist. You need somebody that knows what they're doing to to um, be taking care of the, the simple cell, but then all of the health care professionals that take care of them, the dentist, the, um, their regular pediatrician, um, and if there's surgery involved. And, you know, Everybody needs to communicate because that, that can be um, crucial to their, their safe care. Uh, and then you have a, a medical alert bracelet that they, they have sickle cell because that, that's uh, a different story when if there's some kind of emergency or a car wreck or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it does say avoid strenuous physical exertion and contact sports, as should adults with sickle cell disease. Um, but that's not what they did in the video, of course. So, okay. Um, and then. Can I skip one? No, mine are, mine are separate. I did. I have one that says acute pain. Do you have one that says acute pain? There it is. Sorry. Okay. I just, my thumb just got heavy there. 
So we went in to do the, the, the pay meds around the clock. We already said that PCA conference, client control, analgesia, and, and they, they may, um, you may be able to educate the, the parent and the child to be able to, to do that. This is the kids can, can work video games and, and on computers just when they're just real tiny. So they, they have kids that can, um, in this day and time, would, would easily be able to learn that um, unless they had some sort of um, um, developmental delays or something. But uh, they, you certainly want to keep them comfortable and support their joints and their extremities on pillows um, or, or mattresses so that you don't have um, stress on their joints or other body parts when they're, they're in the crisis because the perfusion is certainly not good to the, to the joints either. There's, there's um, infarctions in the joints sometimes. So you don't want to use um, hot or cold compresses for pain management within the, in the sickle cell crisis because the, the tissue is fragile when, the, when it's not getting enough perfusion and then um, there can be some abnormal sensations so that would increase the risk of, of burn injuries just like in older people. We talked about that in safety way back in the fall. Um, the, the older people are more susceptible to, to having burns because they may not um, have the sensation that, um, like for bath water and that sort of thing. And then cold compresses can promote what? Sick. Yeah, it might can, um, promote more sickling. So, um, let's look at that. I have one more video that's a little short here. The things that we learned way back last fall that you probably learned in kindergarten, all those kinds of things that you know, the hand washing is the very most important thing. So, um, and. Uh, <coughs> and uh, Foam in, foam out if they're in the hospital, of course. We certainly don't want them to get um, get sick in the use of vaccines. They really, really, really need, need to have the, the... The only thing is their immune system is probably not suppressed as much as far as being able to respond to the vaccines. Like somebody on chemotherapy may not be able to develop as many antibodies, but, but people with sickle cell may be able to, to, have, to develop more antibodies. It's just that they are, because of the perfusion issues, is what makes them susceptible or we can call them immunosuppressed. Okay, and delayed growth and development can, can happen just um, well, partly because of hypoxia sometimes. So that they need to eat high protein and high calorie diet and they need to have plenty of vitamins in their diet, fruits and vegetables. If you eat, eat plenty of fruits and vegetables with only gas and vitamin C and everything could be a problem, but um, it's probably safer with this, this population of uh, kids and adults too to, um, to take supplements just to make sure that they get it. Um, get what they need, and um, then then you need to, um, to monitor their their fluid intake. Make sure that they drink plenty of fluids and stay hydrated, um, and monitor the intake and, and output. And um, and uh, they need to be hydrated, especially if they're if they've exerted themselves a lot. They need to hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. And then if they're if they're sick, you can't let them get dehydrated. If they if they're not drinking, if they're nauseated and vomiting, they need to go get hydrated. Um, um, we certainly need to, to uh, make sure that, some, that the pediatrician is is, um, is assessing the growth and development to make sure that they're they're meeting their developmental tasks for their particular age group, and um, they certainly need to to continue in school and, and to continue to learn. Um, and that we certainly don't want um, any ill child to not to to be deprived of, of learning, even if they have to have private tutors. And of course, with children in particular, or well, adults too, the caregiver or strain. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to make sure that, that the caregiver knows the, the signs of infection and the crises, and, and when they need to go um, seek care, and when they can do things themselves. Um, refer for the genetic counseling and support groups, and, and um, try to have um, a broad uh, base of support if at all possible, and for your friends or family. To, to help out because it, it can really uh, bring you down if it's if there's somebody sick of most of the time. Um, and you can go to the, there is a, a website that, that um, was referred to in your book. It's www.sicklecelldisease.org. I don't know, did I put that on your note page or did I just yes. say, okay, because I, I wrote myself notes and something I didn't, I didn't print it back out, so I wasn't sure if I had put it on there before, but the, the one, the site that I'm giving you is National Institutes of Health, so um, does anybody have, have questions about the, the single cell content? Mm -hmm. um, what, what I want to do now, I, I thought about a, a way to, 
to memorize those or anything. It just gives you a perspective as to which kinds of leukemias are, are more prevalent. And, and um, is the the A the AML is the the most common acute leukemia, and then the CLL is the the most common um, chronic leukemia, and it's actually about a third of, of all leukemia cases. So that's probably the very most common one that you see is CLL, the chronic lymphocytic leukemia. But um, that's that's not as important as just kind of knowing what um, what each one of them. Um, has, what, what the main characteristics are. Uh, but acute and chronic are, are definitely two different things. So, um, but that, that's really just a, a perspective kind of thing with those, those stats there. Okay. Um, you're, you do acute, chronic, lymphocytic, and myeloid. Those are some, some other um, ways to break it down. From the lymphocytic line, lymphocytes versus like the neutrophils. Um, so the myeloid line would be like um, neutrophils and neutrophils and those and stuff like that. Then the lymph lymphocytes are the ones for the, the lymphocytic. And um, the, it is the, the most most common kind of cancer in, in which group? Children. Children, yes. But just realize for perspective's sake that it affects 10 times more adults than it does children. So, so mm. the, the main cause of uh, uh, death in children is not is not leukemia, but um, what is it? Accidents. Accidents. Yeah, accidental Okay. And then there's other illnesses in there. Okay. 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 In, in essence, the leukemias are a whole lot of different diseases, but um, there's malignant, immature WBCs, or um, abnormal, immature circulating WBCs, and that's that's a real bad shift to the left when it's um, those really, really abnormal ones that that um, don't even resemble the, the cell of origin that are just, just very, very immature and they're almost down to the stem cell that doesn't know what it's supposed to do yet. Um, and then now there, there's an exception to some that with some other clients, and I'll tell you that, that later. But you can actually have those cells go into the organs, the liver, the spleen, and the lymph nodes, all of your body can, can actually have the mutation of those, those abnormal cells too. So, um, I think y'all know by now the difference between acute and chronic, right? Yeah. Acute means really fast onset and it, and it progresses fast and it has more immature or undifferentiated blast cells. And the blast is the big thing with acute leukemias. You're not going to see um, many bl uh, blast cells in a chronic period. There may be some, and, uh, but, um, but it, as far as that diagnosis, um, you're, you're going to see a lot more blast cells with acute leukemia in it. To, to divide really, 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 really frequently. When you've got really, really, really frequently divided cells, how well do they respond to chemotherapy? Yeah, really well when they're dividing off because that's what chemotherapy does kill dividing cells pretty much is the, the, the way that that works. So um, what else can happen then if you, you have, a, if you've just got like 64,000 white blood cells, and you all of a sudden just wham that person with some some uh, chemotherapy. What what um, oncologic emergency might we be anticipating? Well, if they've got an infection, but what what about if you're um, if, they, if you've got these immature cells that are dividing more rapidly, you're sixty four thousand on and you're getting chemotherapy, and the rapidly dividing cells respond really quickly to chemotherapy. What what are you using? Not professor. Tumor lysis. I'm just glad that you knew the answer. Not professor. Good thing. So you have to compensate for that by doing, doing what? How are you going to avoid the tumor lysis syndrome? Fluids. Yeah, fluids and what else maybe? Um, yeah, the allopurinol. I heard that was yeah. here. Allopurinol or, or um, whatever that raspberry taste. Yes. 
differentiated. They're, they um, are mature cells that aren't, aren't right. And they don't work right. They don't do what they're supposed to do. So they, they look different than white. Okay. And then the lymphocytic or lymphoblastic, they may call it, um, is immature lymphocytes in the precursor cells in the bone marrow. And then the myeloid is the um, the myeloid skin cells in the um, granule sites. Um, and, and RBCs are, are um, uh, part of the myeloid line too, and uh, thrombocytes, but, but it's, it's usually affecting the, the, uh, the WBCs when we're talking about that. But the, the myeloid line does include RBCs and thrombocytes that, that makes the platelets, breaks into the fragments that is platelets. So um, what I want you to do is to know the most common types of leukemia in the children, in children and adults. Um, and that um, will go over some of that. But, um, just, just so you know, there can be, just like there can be small cell and non-small cell lung cancer in the same patient, you can have um, you know, components of both, um, and that makes it more difficult to treat. And that you can have a um, combination of lim uh, lymphoid and myeloid um, uh, characteristics in, in leukemia, and that's called bi Phenotypes. You've got two different phenotypes, is what they're saying. Genetic kind of, kind of deal there. Okay, I don't want to do this too long, but let's, let's just start with the AML. And it is actually uh, represents 80% of the acute leukemia cases in adults, or close thereabouts, because some of my statistics are a little bit older than the ones that are on that other slide. But it's, it's, main, it's the main one for adults. So which is another one for children? Uh, AML, right. So AML is the one for um, that's more common in adults. So just realize that those are different. That might help you remember that all the children is not the same as adults. Um, and there can be a complete remission in about 66% of people that get treated for it. They, they decide not to take treatment or they don't go until they're They've got a um, deadly infection or something like that, and they're certainly not going to have a remission. But um, it says that even though you have 66% of total remission, meaning that there's no sign of it in the bone marrow at all, um, then um, only 30 to 40% have a long-term remission or a, um, or a, a total cure where it never comes back in, in adults. So that's that's not it's not near as promising in adults as far as it, it, it is treatable, but it's not, not as curable as it is in, in uh, the ALL is in children. Um, but anyway, there are eight subtypes uh, of, of AML, and you don't have to know them. But, um, I don't know. I didn't treat people with any, <coughs> any patients except that if we had to do something just intermittently in between them uh, visiting a, um, a cancer, one of the cancer centers like Baptist or um, or sometimes uh, at, at CMC or Duke or whatever, we would um, sometimes just be sort of in between, but we didn't actually do the, um, many of the major treatments. So I, I wasn't as, as well versed on, on the leukemias as I was on the solid tumors. But um, anyway, the, you know, they are, um, the types are based on specific chromosomal abnormalities and the precursor cells and everything, like promyelocytes and the um, uh, pro promyelocytic leukemia, APL, acute promyelocyte uh, leukemia, is the most curable of the leukemia. Okay, I actually had a student of you years ago whose daughter got that. She was like 22 or 24 or something like that. And, um, <coughs> and she, she had that, that um, APL, and so, well, APML is what they call it sometimes. Um, but she she got along really well. I'd like to know how she is now. But but um the the student actually had to quit school and and um, and go take care of her daughter because she lived out um, out of state and um, and so she got along really well with her treatment and everything. And they said it was really very promising that she, she would 
this tomorrow. But um, this, I'm, I'm not going to do the 